Excuse me. Chapter 19. Dixon looked at the telephone where it stood on a black plush cloth in the middle of a bamboo table situated in Miss Cutler's drawing room. He felt like an alcoholic surveying a bottle of gin. Only by using it could be obtained the relief he wanted, but its side effects, as recent experience had proved, were likely to be deleterious. He must cancel the tea date with Christine now only six hours ahead. To do that, he must take the chance of Mrs. Welch answering the phone. This and other circumstances, a certain deterrent, he decided to risk in preference to keeping the date and telling Christine to her face that their little adventure was at an end. The thought of such a meeting being their last was not to be endured. He sat down by the phone, gave the number, and in a few seconds heard Mrs. Welch's voice. It didn't discompose him, but before saying anything, he made his last... He made his last scar's face in order to draw off his anger. And Mrs. Welch spent all her time sitting... As she perhaps had a bed made up with an arm's length of the phone in case he might ring up. Trying to connect you, he fluted as he'd planned. Hello, who is that? Mrs. Walsh mentioned her number. Speak up, London, he went on. You're through. Then he jammed his teeth together, opened his mouth loudly as far as he could, and said in a growling, overcultured bass, Hello, her, hello, her, following this w with a whining, You're through, London, and in the bass voice, Hello, her, have ya a Miss Callahan staying with ya, please? He made a rushing, please noise with his mouth. He made a rushing noise with his mouth, which he thought imitated lying disturbances. Who's that speaking, please? Dixon rocked to and fro as if in grief, bringing his mouth up to the phone and back again as he spoke. Hello, hello. Forty sky, hiya. Forty sky, hiya. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch. Forty sky, Forty sky. Who is that speaking? It sounds like Hallaher. Is that you, Miss Callahan? Is that you, Mr. Fartiskia, Dixon bawled desperately, muffling his mouth with his hand and trying not to cough. That's Mr. Dixon, isn't it? What are you trying to? Hello? Kindly stop this ridiculous this. Three minutes up, he neighed, slobbering. Finish off, please. Time's up. He added at a last throat peeling. Hello? The phone at the full length of his arm and fell silent. This was a root. This was a root. R O U T. This is a route. Meaning, if you're. This is a route. If you're still there, Mr. Dixon, Mrs. Welch said after a moment in a voice sharpened to excoriation by the intervening few miles of line, I'd like to tell you that if you make one more attempt to interfere in my son's or my affairs, then I shall have to ask my husband to take the matter up with you from a disciplinary point of view, a disciplinary point of view, and also that other, and also that other matter of the Dixon rang off. She, he said, trembling, he reached for his cigarettes. In the last few days, he'd given up all attempt to ration himself. You have to keep this date now. A telegram will be too would be too curt and mrs welch would proudly station herself so as to intercept it anyway as he was lighting his cigarette the bell of the phone went off within two feet of his head he started violently and began coughing and took up the phone who could this be in a in a voice for john's most likely or perhaps a clarinetist he said hello a voice he realized with relief was quite strange to him said Oh, have you a uh, Mr. Dixon living there speaking? Oh, Mr. Dixon, I'm so glad I got you. University gave me the number. My name's Catchpole. I expect you heard of me from Margaret Peel. Dixon grew tense. Yes, I have, he said noncommittally. It wasn't the sort of voice he'd have expected Catchpole to have. It was quiet, polite, apparently diffident. I rang up because I thought you might be able to give some news of Margaret. I've been away recently, and I haven't managed to get to hear anything of her since I got back. How is she these days, you know? Why don't you get a hold of her and ask for her yourself? Or perhaps you tried that, and she won't speak to you. Well, I can't understand that. Dixon began to tremble again. I think there must be some mistake about I got her address, but I don't see why I would give it to you, of all people. Mr. Dixon, I can't understand why you're taking that tone. All I want to know is how Margaret is. There can't be anything objectionable about that, can there? I warn you that if you're thinking of making a comeback with her, you're wasting your time. See, I don't know what you mean by that. Are you sure you haven't got me confused with someone else? Your name's Catchpole, isn't it? Yes, please. Well, I know who you are, right then, and all about you. Please give me a hearing, Mr. Dixon. The voice at the other end shook lightly. I just wanted to know whether Margaret is all right or not. Won't you even tell me that? Dixon, calm down and disappear. All right, I will. She's in quite good health physically mentally she's about as well as can be expected thanks very much i'm glad to hear that do you mind if i ask you one more question what is it why were you so angry with me a moment ago when i asked you about her that's pretty obvious isn't it not to me i'm afraid i think we're talking rather at a cross purposes aren't we i can't think of any reason why you should have a grudge against me no real reason that is it sounded remarkably sincere well i can dixon said unable to keep the puzzlement out of his voice there's some kind of mix up here i can't i can't see that i'd like to meet you sometime if i may and try to strain things out we can do it over the phone. What about it? Dixon hesitated. All right. Oh, we can't do it over the phone. What about it? Dixon has All right. What do you suggest? They arranged to meet for a pre-lunch drink in a pub at the foot of College Road the next day but one Thursday. 
When Casper had rung off, Dixon sat for a few minutes smoking. It was worrying, but then most of the things that had happened to him recently were that and a good deal more besides. Anyway, he turned up and see that, or what was it? Keep quiet about it to Margaret, of course. What a sigh he referred to the pocket diary for 1943 in which he wrote down telephone numbers, pulled the phone towards him again, and gave a London number. In a little while, he said, Is Dr. Catan there, please? There was another brief delay, then a rich, confident voice came clearly over the line. This is Catan. Dixon gave his name and that of his college. For some reason, the riches and confidence of the other voice waned sharply. What do you want? It asked snappishly. I read about your appointment, Dr. Catan. Incidentally, may I offer my congratulations, and I was wondering what was going to happen to the article of mine you were enough to accept. You were good enough to accept for your journal. Can you tell me when it'll come out? Ah, oh, now, Mr. Dickerson. Things are very difficult these days, you know. The voice was confident again, as if reciting a sane lesson and knew it knew. There's quite a lot of stuff waiting to go in, as you can imagine. You really mustn't expect your article, which I like very much, I say, to go in five minutes, you know. I appreciate that, Dr. Catan. I can quite understand there must be long, a long queue. I was just wondering if you could give me some sort of tentative date, that's all. I wish you knew how difficult things are here, Mr. Diggerson. Setting up our kind of stuff and kind of stuff in type is a job which only exceptionally highly skilled composer can tackle have you ever thought what slow work it must be getting even half a page of footnotes set up no but i can quite see it must be a very complicated matter all i wanted to know actually is a rough idea of what you think you can manage to get my article out or when you think well as to that mr dickerson things aren't by any means as simple as they may look to you probably know hardy of trinity i've had a thing of his at the printers for weeks now and two or three times a day or even more i get them coming through on the phone with some query or other very often, of course, I just have to refer them to him. When it's a question of a foreign document or something of that kind, I know chaps in your position think an editor's job all beer and skittles is very far from being that, believe me. I'm sure it must be more, be most exacting, Dr. Catani, and of course I wouldn't dream of trying to pin you down to anything definite, but it's rather important to me to have some estimate of when you'll be able to publish my article. I can't start making promises to have your article out next week, the voice said in a nettled tone. As if Dixon had been stupidly insisting on this one point, with things as difficult as they are, surely you must see that you don't seem to realize the amount of planning that goes into each number, especially your first number. It's not like drawing up a railway timetable. What? What? He finished loudly and suspiciously. Dixon wondered if, without knowing it, he allowed an imprecation to pass his lips. A hollow metallic tapping had begun on the line, like galvanized iron being hammered in a cathedral. In a louder voice, he said, I'm sure it isn't, and I'm quite resigned to the delay. But to be quite frank, Dr. Catone, I want rather urgently to improve my standing in the department here, and if I could just quote you, if you could give me a... I'm sorry to hear of your difficulties, Mr. Dickinson, but I'm afraid things are too difficult here for me to be very seriously concerned about your difficulties. There are plenty of people in your position, you know. I don't know what I should do if they all started demanding promises from me in this fashion. But Dr. Catan, I haven't been asking you for a promise. All I want is an estimate, and even the vaguest estimate would help me. The second half of the next year, for example, you won't be committing yourself on the lease by just giving me an estimate. There was a silence which Dixon interpreted as one of maturing rage. Could I have the permission to say the second half of next year when I'm asked? Though Dixon waited for ten seconds or more, nothing answered him except the metallic tapping which had increased in volume and, peace, and pace. It's raining a lot. Please. Things are very difficult. Things are very difficult. Things are very difficult. Dix Dixon gabbled into the phone that mentioned a few difficult things which occurred to him as suitable tasks for Dr. Catone to have a go at it. Still devising variations of this theme, he went out muttering to himself, wagging his head and shoulders like a puppet. A rival to Welch had appeared in the field of evasion technique, verbal division, and in the physical division of the same field this chap had Welch whacked at the start. South removal to South America was the traditional climax of an evasive career. Up in his room, Dixon filled his lungs to the utmost and groaned for half a minute or more without drawing breath. He got out of the notes for his lecture and went on working them up into a script. Five hours later, he had what he estimated as 44 minutes worth of lecture. It seemed by then as if there were no facts anywhere in the universe in his own brain or anyone else's or just lying about loose, which could possibly be brought, be brought within his present scope. And even so, he'd been traveling for a large part of his 44 minutes along the knife edge, dividing the conceivably just about relevant from the irreducibly, immitigably irrelevant. The 15 minutes needed to top the thing up to the 50, 59 minutes he said himself would have to be occupied by a presumably rather extensive conclusion. 
and he didn't want to write one of those, something on the lines of finally, thank God for the 20th century was satisfying, but it wouldn't satisfy Welch. Then he sees his pencil again, gave a happy laugh and wrote, this survey, brief as it is, would have no purpose if left as mere. He crossed out mere historical record. There are valuable lessons here for us, living in the age of prefabricated amusements as we do. One wonders how one of the men or women I have tried to describe would react to such typically modern phenomena as the cinema, the radio, the television. What would he think, accustomed as he was, had been, would have been, is to making his own music, must look at Welch at this point of a society where people like himself are regarded as oddities, where to play an instrument himself, oneself, instead of paying others to do so, to sing a madrigal instead of a cheap dance lyric, is to incur the dreaded title of Crank, where... He stopped writing and ran out into the bathroom. He started washing with frenzied speed. He left it just late enough. With luck, he'd have time to get ready and rush along to the hotel for tea with Christine, but no time to think about tea with Christine. Nevertheless, for all the energy of his movements, he began to feel a little queasy with apprehension. He arrived at the hotel two minutes late. On turning into the lounge where tea was served, he felt a pang of fear, whatever emotion it was, kicking at his diaphragm when he saw Christine already sitting, waiting for him. He counted on a few minutes, Grace, to think of things to say to her. If it had been Margaret, he'd have them and more. He'd have had them and more. She smiled as he approached. Hello, Jim. He was feeling physically very nervous. Hello, he said with a half cough, fighting off temptations to see that his tie was straight, his pocket flaps not tucked in, his flies buttoned. He sat down cautiously in front of her. Today she wore a jacket of the same material as her plum colored skirt, and these and the white blouse all seemed very, um, all seemed newly ironed. She looked unmanningly pretty. So much so that Dixon's head began to spin with the effort of thinking of something to say, something different from what he come on purpose to say. How are you, she asked. All right, thanks. I've been working. You managed to get away without any fuss, I hope. I don't know about without any fuss. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What happened? I think Bertrand was rather suspicious. I told him there were one or two things I wanted to do in town. I didn't mention anything in particular because I thought that would have looked a bit quite... And how did he take that? Not too well. He came back with a lot of things about me being my own mistress and I was to do what I wanted to do. It wasn't to feel I was tied in any way. It made me feel rather mean. I can understand that, all right. She leaned forward and put her elbows on the low circular table between them. You see, Jim, in a way, I think it was rather a bad thing my coming to meet you at all, but I said I would, and so I had came. And of course, I still wanted to just as much as I did when you asked me, but I've been thinking it all over, and I decided, look, shall we have our tea first and then talk about it? Well, tell me now whatever it is you want to say. All right, then. It's this, Jim. I think I was a bit carried away by one thing and another. Then, when you asked me to come today, I mean, I think I wouldn't have said I'd come if I'd had time to think about what I was doing. I still have wanted to come just as much, though. I'm sorry to have gone on to this straight away. We've hardly had time to say hello to each other, but you can see what I'm heading up to, can't you? Dixon didn't reflect that his attitude would... Dixon didn't reflect that his attitude would make his task an easy one. He said it in a flat voice. You mean you don't want to go on with this? I don't really see how we could go on with it, do you? I wish I'd left all this till later, but it's been rather on my mind. You see, you're sort of stuck stuck up here, aren't you? Or do you get to London fairly often? No, I hardly ever go there. Well, then, the only chance we'd have to see each other would be when Bertrand asked me to come and stay with his parents like now, and I wouldn't feel right about sneaking off to see you the whole time. And in any case, she stopped and made a facial movement, which caused Dixon to turn around his chair. A youthful waiter had approached, his footfalls silenced by the carpet, and was now shifting from one foot to the other close by, breathing through his mouth. Dixon thought he'd never seen a human frame radiating so much insolence without recourse to speech, gesture, or any contortion of the features. His figure swung a silver tray in an attempt, an attempt at careless grace and was looking past Dixon at Christine when Dixon said, Tea for two, please. The waiter, waiter smiled faintly at her as if in, in lofty but sincere commiseration then swung aside, allowing the tray to rebound from his kneecap as he walked off. Sorry, what were you saying, Dixon said. It's just what I am, oh, tied up with Bertrand, that's all. It's not so much a question of having obligations towards him or anything like that. I just don't want to behave foolishly. Not that I think there's something foolish about coming to see you. Oh, I just don't seem to be able to put it in a way that sounds at all sensible. Little by little and intermittently, she was adopting her dignant tone and physical attitude. I'm afraid all I can ask you to do is try to understand. I know that's what people always say. And I don't feel I understand very myself, very well myself. So how can I expect you to? I don't know, but there it is. You're going back on what you said about being rather fed up with Bertrand then. No, all that's still quite true. What I'm trying to do now is take the rough with the smooth. The rough parts are still as rough as they were when we talked about it in the taxi, but I must make an effort. I mustn't walk out of things just when I feel like it. I can't go about expecting people to behave as I want them the whole to the whole time. They're bound to be a certain amount of up and down in a relationship like the one I'm having with Bertrand. It's no use getting in a patty about that. It's got to be accepted. Even if I don't want to accept it, the trouble is I've got to push you around while I'm doing it. 
Don't worry about that. Dixon said, you must do as you think best. Whatever I do can't be very satisfactory, she said. I feel I've been very stupid the whole way through. Though her pose was now complete, Dixon barely noticed it. What I want to stop you thinking is that I was being frivolous about, you know, letting you kiss me and saying I'd come today and all that. And I meant everything I said. I wouldn't have said it otherwise. And I don't want you to think that I was doing just for fun or that I've decided since I don't like you enough or anything like that. It's not like that. And you're not to think of it as think it is. That's all right, Christine. You can forget about the part of it. Oh, here we are. The waiter reappeared at Dixon's side with a loaded tray. This he half lowered, half dropped to within an inch of the table, then with an offensive exaggeration of carry, laid it soundlessly to rest. Straining up, he gave another smile, this time at Dixon paused, as if to emphasize his non intention of setting out any of the tea things and moved off, counterfeiting a heavy limp. Christine began moving crockery about and pouring tea. When she gave him his cup, he said, I'm sorry, Jim. I didn't want to be like this about it. Have a sandwich? No thanks. I don't want anything to eat. She nodded and began eating with every appearance of appetite. Dixon was interested by this conventional absence of conventional sensitivity. For almost the first time in his life, a woman was behaving in a way alleged to be typical of women. After all, she said, you've got your commitments with Margaret, haven't you? He sighed rather tremulously, although the worst part of the encounter was theoretically over without yet having on him the numbing effect that he knew it soon would have. He still felt nervous. Yes, he replied. That was what I was going to tell you about this afternoon. Only you got in first. I came here to tell you that I thought we shouldn't see any more of each other from my own point of view because of my business with Margaret. I see she began eating another sandwich. Things have all rather come to a head in the last few days, as a matter of fact, since the ball, really. She looked at him quickly. There was a row over that, was there? Well, yes, I suppose you could say that. A good deal than a row, actually. There you are, you see. I was causing all sorts of trouble by sneaking off with you like that. Don't be silly, Christine, Dixon said, really. You're talking as if you were the one who initiated everything. If anybody was responsible for our sorts of trouble, as you call it, it was me. Not that I think I'm much to blame for anything any more than you were. It was all perfectly natural. All this self-reproach strikes me as a bit forced. I'm sorry. I must have put it badly. I wasn't forcing anything as far as I knew. No, I don't suppose you were for a moment. I didn't mean to sound hot under the collar. The Margaret business has been getting me down, rather. How bad was it? What did she say to you? Oh, she said all sorts of things. There wasn't much she could have said she didn't say. You make it sound pretty formidable. What actually went on? Dixon sighed again and drank some tea. It's all so complicated. I don't want to bore you with it. You won't bore me. I'd like to hear if you feel you want to tell me. It's your turn after all. The grin she gave with his remark nearly put Dixon right off his stroke. Was she really finding this funny? That's why he said heavily. Well, there's a lot of past history that's all mixed up with it, you see. She's a decent girl, really, and I like her a lot. At, late, at least I would if she'd only let me, but... I've got tied up with her without really meaning to, though I know that sounds ridiculous. When I first met her last October sometime, she was going around with a fellow called Catchpole. He gave a compressed, but otherwise only slightly edited account of his past relations with Margaret, finishing with her visit to the pictures the previous evening. He gave a cigarette to Christine, who eating all the food the, the waiter brought, took one himself and said, so now it's all more or less on again, though I shouldn't like to have to explain what it is that's more or less on again and on a bit vague too. On again. On's a bit vague, too. I don't think she knows quite how interested I've been in you, by the way. I don't imagine she thanked me for telling her. Christine avoided his eyes, puffing amateurish. She had a cigarette. She asked in a disinterested tone, how do you think she seemed when you left her? Just the same as she'd been all the evening, quite quiet and apparently sensible. I know that sounds pretty offensive. I don't quite mean that. I mean she well. She wasn't so excitable. There wasn't any of the nervous tension about her that there usually is. Do you think she'll go on being like that now that she feels things are more settled? Well, I must admit, I've been beginning to hope. Now that the hope was voiced, it seemed ludicrously naive. Well, I don't know. It doesn't make much difference anyway. You sound pretty miserable about the whole business. Do I? It hasn't been easy, certainly. No, and it's not going to get any easier. It is. Is it? When Dixon, irritated by this question, said nothing, she went on tapping ash into a saucer. I don't suppose you want me to say this, but you must realize it yourself. I should think. I don't see how either of you can be very happy with the other one. Dixon tried to suppress his irritation. No, I don't suppose we can, but there's nothing to do about it. It's just, it's just what we can't split up, that's all. Well, what are you going to do then? Are you going to get engaged to her or anything? It was the same curiosity that he sh as she's shown some weeks ago about his drinking habits. I don't know, he said coldly, trying not to think about getting engaged to Margaret. I suppose it's possible if things are, if things carry on as they are for a time. She didn't seem to notice his unfriendly tone. Shifting in her seat, she glanced around the room, then said didactically. Well, it looks as if we're both taking of, doesn't it? It just says, well... Um, the authoritative um, vapidity of this reacted 
where Dixon's general feeling of peevish regret made him begin to talk fast. Yes, there's not really much to choose between us you, when you look into it. You're keeping up your little affair with Bertram because you think that on the whole it's safer to do that in spite of the risk attached to that kind of thing. There's a chance you're arguing with me. You know the snags about it. You know the snags about him, but you don't know what snags there might be about me. And I'm sticking to Margaret because I haven't got the guts to turn her loose and let her look after herself. So I do that instead of doing what I want to do because I'm afraid to. It's just a sort of stodgy, stingy caution that's the matter with this. You can't even call it looking after number one. He looked at her with faint contempt and was hurt to see the, fa the same feeling in the way she looked at him. That's all there is to it. And the worst of it is I shall go on doing exactly what I was going to do in the first place. It just shows how little it helps you to know where you stand. For some reason, this last remark brought into his mind the thought that a few words from him could dispose of Christine's attachment to Bertrand. He'd only to tell her what Carol had told him, but she probably knew perhaps she was so devoted to Bertrand that she wouldn't break with him even over a thing like that, would rather have half of him than nothing at all. And anyway, what would she think of him if he came out with with that at this point? No, he might as well forget about that. It seemed there'd never be a valid opportunity to make that disclosure to anyone which was cruelly unfair considering how loyally he kept his mouth shut and how long he waited for the right moment. Christina had bowed her head how, how well brushed her hair was over the saucer where she was stubbing out her cigarette. I think you're making a bit of a fuss more than you need, don't you? Nothing's happened between us to speak of, has it? She still kept her face down. Agreed, but that's not the way to judge. She met his eyes now, her face flushed, and this silenced him. I think it's silly to talk the way you were talking, she said with a faint cockney intonation about her voice that she'd half noticed before you seem to think you'd prove something by saying all that of course that's what we're doing you talk as if that's all we're doing don't you think people ever do things because they want to do them because they want to do what's best what's for the best i don't see how it helps to call trying to do the right thing caution and lack of guts doing what you know you got to do is horrible sometimes but that doesn't mean to say it isn't worth doing there was something you said it made me think you got the idea i sleep with Bertrand. You can't know much about the woman if you think that. No wonder you're having a rough time if that's sort of hap a thing you think. You're the sort of man who would never be happy whatever you did. I think I'll go now, Jim. There's not much point in... No, don't go, Dixon said in agitation. Things were happening much too fast for him. Don't be angry. Stay a little longer. I'm not angry. I'm just fed up with it all. So am I. Four shillings away to sit at Dixon's side. His voice heard now for the first time suggested that he had a half eaten. S suggested that he had a half eaten sweet at the back of his throat. Dixon searched his pockets and gave him two half crowns. He was glad of the interpretation interruption, which allowed him time to recover something of his emotional balance. When they were alone, he said, Are we going to see each other again? Then, once more anyway, I'm coming to your lecture and to the sherry party at the principals before it. Oh, God, Christine, you don't want to come to that. You'll be bored stiff. How have you let yourself in for that? Uncle Julius has been asked by the principal, and it seems he said he'd come in a weak moment. And now he insists on me coming to keep him company. Rather queer. He said he was looking forward to meeting you again. Why the hell did he say that? I've already said two words to the man. Well, that's what he said. Don't ask me what he meant. I shall see you at a distance then anyway. Good thing, really. Christine suddenly said in a different tone. No, it isn't a good thing, really. How can it be? It'll be wonderful fun, won't it? Standing there chatting away. Bertrand and Uncle Julius and the rest of them like a good little girl. Oh, yes, I shall be having a fine time. Thanks very much. It's all so... It's intolerable. She stood up and so did Dixon, who could find nothing to say. That's about enough of that. This time I really am going. Thank you for the tea. Give me your address, Christine. She looked at him scornfully, her brown eyes dilated under the dark eyebrows. That'll do no good at all. What on earth would be the point? It would make me feel we hadn't seen the last of each other. Wow, there's no point in feeling that, is there? She won't. She went quickly past him and out of the room without looking back. Dixon sat down again and smoked another cigarette with an almost cold half cup of tea. He wouldn't have thought it possible that a man who done so exactly what he set out to do could feel so violent a sense of failure and general uselessness. He reflected for a moment that if Christine looked like Margaret and Margaret looked like Christine, his spirits would not be very much higher, but that was to speculate about nonities. But that was to speculate about nonities. Margaret with Christine's face and body could never have turned into Margaret. All that could logically be said was that Christine was lucky to look so nice. It was luck you needed all along. With just a little more luck, he'd, ha he'd have been able to switch his life on it onto a momentarily adjoining track, a track destined to swing aside at once away from his own. He gave a start and jumped up. It must be nearly time for the examiner's meeting, diverting his attention from the thought that Margaret would be there. He went out, that came back again and approached the waiter who was leaning against the wall. Can I have my change, please? Change? Yes, change. Can I have it, please? Five shillings he gave me. Yes. The bill was four shillings. I want a shilling back. 
Wasn't that from my tip? It might have been, but it isn't now. Give it to me. The whole shilling? Yes, all of it. I'll give it to me. The waiter made no attempt to produce any money. In his half-choked voice, he said, most people give me a tip. Most people would have kicked your arse for you by now. Most people would have kicked your arse for you by now. If you don't give me my change in the next five seconds, I shall call the manager. Four seconds later, Dixon was on the way out of the hotel in the sunlight, his shilling in his pocket. Another long-ass chapter. I was chapter, uh, I'm on chapter 20 now.